Hey, Integrity Church, looks like we got dished up a little bit of a of a curveball. Hey, speaking of curveballs, have you been watching the Yankees these last couple of days? They are absolutely crushing it. It's been so exciting to watch every game and all the home runs and all the runs. I'm so sorry, Met fans. Um, but anyway, hey, obviously you're home. I'm home right now. And we are not together in church because we got dished up a little surprise. But you know what? I'm so blessed today that we can still connect in this way. And you're going to be so excited to hear the message that Rob Chestnut and Audrey bring to us. They are our missionaries that we support over in the Czech Republic. And they are certainly no stranger to us. Thankfully, they just preached over at our sister church in Dix Hills. And we're able to bring that message to you supposed to be live but unfortunately we have to do it this way but anyway i know you'll be blessed and uh we look forward to uh, reconnecting in a couple days again if you need anything certainly feel free to reach out to us we love you we look forward to seeing you soon god bless hey why don't you stand and join me let's let's just worship the lord this morning together we got an exciting song and uh it's just a great opportunity to rejoice and thank god for all he's done
There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history They're on a cross they make for sin in us For every curse is blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn But sacrifice was made As the heavens roared
We're going to continue worshiping the Lord together in our tithes and offerings. We just want to say thank you so much for your continued support and your generosity extended towards us. But even more, thank you for obeying the Lord and bringing your tithes and offerings into the storehouse, the way in which the scripture calls us to. Let's pray together and ask God's blessing on the finances. Father, thank you, Lord, for your generosity towards us. We recognize that, Lord, you're the giver of all things. And and we pray, Lord, that as we bring our tithes and our offerings um, to you as an act of worship, we pray that, Lord, you'd be glorified that, Lord, you use it to um, bring forth the gospel of Jesus to this world around us. We commit it all into your hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for sharing with us. Hi, Integrity Church. Uh, we are the Chestnuts, Rob and Audrey. Hello. And we're sending greetings to you from the Cross Island Ferry because we're headed back to Long Island <laughs> at such a time as this. Um, we are so sorry we can't be with you guys this morning. We really uh, are saddened by that opportunity, but we're really thankful that we uh, recorded this message and also that we spoke last week at Dix Hills and we're able to share what we wanted to share with all of you uh, right now through this uh, virtual medium, if you will. We're thankful for you all at Integrity. Thank you for your support and uh, we wish we could be there with you. Yeah, I had a great time with the youth group on Friday night and again, we're so disappointed we can't be with you, but we hope you stay safe uh, over the course of the next 24 hours. We'll be praying for you. Thanks again for all of your support for us over the years. And uh, well, obviously now we have to come back and see you guys again because uh, I'm sorry for bringing this Florida weather with us. But thanks again for all you do for us and we look forward to seeing you all sometime in the future. See you guys. Bye. Bye. We are the Chestnuts. We serve uh, with Josiah Venture. This is us. It's just a regular casual photo like every day. Uh, uh, that is my wife, Audrey, and then our two girls, Stella and Adria. Uh, they are really excited to be back in the kids' area right now. That's been one of the fun things. Uh, we've been in the States since July 1st, traveling around, uh, visiting other supporters, and so they've gotten the full-on American Sunday School experience. They're kind of, uh, you know, comparing and contrasting as to like, oh, okay, well, you know, this week we had uh, Fruity Loops, and, you know, are we going to get Fruity Loops at this church? And it's like, well, I don't know. Okay, well, we're going to write that down then, and we'll see. Um, but so our, our organization, as Spencer said, uh, our, our mission and vision behind Josiah Venture is a movement of God among the youth of Central and Eastern Europe that finds its home in the local church and transforms society. Uh, our, our primary focus is those young men and women, those youth leaders throughout this region of the world. So here we get a great little geography lesson. So each one of those countries that's highlighted, that's where JV has a presence. That's where we uh, have, you know, our, our, our main goal is actually not to just have Josiah Venture across the board, but actually to help equip those countries, create their own national organizations that will uh, equip young leaders to fulfill Christ's commission through the local church. And we do that through a variety of different ministries from English camps in the summer to year-round kind of rock choir uh, uh, outreach events. We have sports ministries. We, we do things in schools. We also develop leaders who are uh, leading their youth groups or things along this line. I want to just thank Stephen especially too for BARF. Uh, I'm Definitely taking that with me. I don't know how it's going to translate, but wow, I was not expecting that one this morning. Um, but so, and then uh, when we were with Josiah Venture, our, our, uh, our focus was the English camp ministry, and we were doing that specifically in the Czech Republic itself. Uh, and then we left the field and came back again in 2019, and now we are working through Josiah Ventures' international team uh, through the, the training arm of the organization. And so this is everything from uh, materials to events to training trainers to help train their youth groups with best practices, things along this line, because we recognize that if we can equip the nationals, they will be a thousand times more effective in their ministries, but also they're going to understand the cultures and the implications, because the reality is, folks, you know, so... We're living in the Czech Republic currently. Oh, hang on. Wait, one more map thing real quick. So we're living in the Czech Republic, which they pride themselves on being the most atheistic country in all of Europe. But if you jump over just north to Poland, everyone's Catholic. 
And so to, you know, join into a Protestant church, you're essentially like joining a cult, essentially. Uh, whereas our, our partners in Romania or even in like Ukraine is a highly orthodox background. So each and every one of the countries provides a, a bit of a different flavor, a bit of a different focus. And we, again, as the organization, are trying to equip them to respond to their needs within their countries. So with the training team, and here I just want to, so now we'll go to the next one. We'll show you guys a picture of the training team. Uh, th- this is my crew, and this represents all of our different countries. We've got Czechs, Ukrainians, Slovaks, Slovenes, uh, uh, Poles, Estonians. Uh, it's, it's, it's a smorgasbord, Latvians. They're, they're all up in there. And uh, this picture was taken March 10th, 2020. Great year, by the way. I don't know how it was for you. And uh, so this was our very first training team uh, meeting. Uh, so this, and I, you know, we moved over in August of 2019. So by March, we were finally able to have our first training team meeting. I was really excited. This is me kind of stepping into the, the role we had come over to do. And, uh, and so I opened up our very first session with this cute little kind of like icebreaker question. I said, hey, there's something going on in another part of the world. What would you do? Ha, 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 ha. If you had to be quarantined, ha 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 ha, for two weeks, ha 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 ha, what, what, what would you do with your time? And so, you know, we went around the table and we answered different questions and everyone kind of chuckled and whatever else. And that was Tuesday. On Thursday, as we're sitting around the tables, the Ukrainians' phones all went off at the exact same moment. And everybody grabbed their phone and they picked it up and they said, the borders are closing in 10 hours and we have to leave right now. And the rest of the world and normal life as we knew it went right out the window with them. So it has been, uh, it's been a time. It has been a season and then some. And uh, for me, as I wrestled with what it was to do our job and and live overseas and respond to the moment that we found ourselves in, uh, I I was conflicted on multiple occasions of just like, who who are we? What do we do? What is going on? And yet everyone else is asking the same question as well. And I think we tried our best in different moments to pivot or innovate uh, in, in different ways. And yet I found myself constantly going back to Scripture and to the Sermon on the Mount, because it was like, if, if I'm going to get through any of this, I, I need guidance directly from Jesus himself and his words. Uh, when I was talking with Pastor Jim, he said that you guys have been doing uh, a summer in the Psalms, which sounds really cool. So I wanted to kind of do the same. So we're doing summer in the Sermon on the Mount. It's close enough, I think, to, to stick with the theme uh, for what it's worth. But the, the Sermon on the Mount for me... Um, is unique in so many ways. I mean, first off, you have this huge chunk of Jesus' teaching. I mean, probably the, the, the largest altogether there in Matthew from chapter 5 to chapter 7. And, and this is really the instruction of what it is to be a believer, what it is to be a Christian and to live the Christian life, to, to bring about the kingdom here on earth. Uh, I once heard a, a speaker at a youth conference, he referenced the Sermon on the Mount this way. He got up and he said, you guys are about to hear the best message you ever have heard in your entire life. And he proceeded to read the Sermon on the Mount in its entirety, closed his Bible, went and sat down and said nothing else. Now, that is not what I'm doing this morning. I just wanted to focus on more of a specific passage uh, because I think also something that happens within churches, and so I, uh, I'm, I am a pastor's kid. For those of you, the, the, the threat at the beginning, my dad's a pastor. He, he worked here at Dix Hills for a time as well, too, uh, and that was a joke, of course. But um, he, uh, um, you know, as a pastor's kid, when we grew up in church, every time the missionaries came, it was like, oh, the missionaries. You know, because, you know, you, 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 have, you have the Trinity and then you have the head pastor and the missionaries are just right there, you know, in terms of like the spiritual hierarchy of things. Uh, and and that's, that's what we got. That's, that's what we experienced. And, you know, you, you got the, the slide projector and all the different stories and things that you heard. And it was like, wow, the missionaries, wow. And uh, I feel my job is partially also to dispel some of those because the reality is uh, we have missionaries right here in this room. I don't know if you're aware, but you have a mission field that's called Long Island, and uh, that is not where God has called us. It's not a place that, that we have been asked to be at, and so I, one of the things I think is really great about Jesus' teaching is he, he, he does not make an aspect of comparison. Um, 
We, we, we like to live in, in a, we live in a world of comparisons. You know, who's got the better house? Who's got the better job? Who's got the better car? Who's got the better ball team? Let's go Mets. Um, did they win last night? Actually, anybody? No? No, that's a big, that's a head shake. Okay. Uh, if you ask me about my Mets knowledge, I've got like John Franco and Bobby Valentine and Mike Piazza, and that's where it stops. So, and Daryl Strawberry, always important. Um, so I, I have no basis to stand on. But we compare. We like to compare. We, we want to put uh, things in categories that makes us feel better. And actually, when we, we look at this passage, and we'll get to it here, uh, we, we recognize that Jesus does not operate in terms of levels or comparison. If anything, he's just talking about an imperative. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 5 today. That's where we're going to be this morning. You can go to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 13 through 16. It's also on the back of uh, the bulletin as well if you want to read it there. And so I'll start. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Now, just for context, so we understand what's going on, this is really the very opening of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus is on the side of a mountain. He's preaching to a, a large crowd of people, and he's just kind of uh, in the beginning of, of this message. And he actually uses terms, uh, as he does even throughout the parables and other times that he's teaching, but he uses terms that are incredibly familiar to the people at hand. And what I think is very fascinating is he also uses terms that are still very relevant to us even in this modern time. And, uh, and so he begins with two very familiar titles, salt and light. That's what he uses to reference things, salt and light. Um, salt is one of those elements that I think today we regularly take for granted. You probably have it on your kitchen table or it's, it's next to your uh, uh, stove or you know, cookware or something along this line. Salt is everywhere. And yet, in, in biblical times, salt had multiple purposes. In fact, as I went through kind of studying on the back end, the word salary is actually the, the basis of it comes from the Latin terms of being paid in salt. Because Roman soldiers in that time would actually literally be paid in salt. So maybe you've heard the term, he's not worth his salt, that's where this comes from. It basically, you weren't a good enough soldier. So here we are, like salt as a form of currency, literally. In fact, even upwards into the 1950s, certain countries were using salt as a form of currency. So it, it had a very special place in the lives of people throughout the ages. And, and even now, salt also has, you know, we, we're still using it on a fairly regular basis, I would believe. What, what are some of the uses for salt? Flavor, yes, flavor. We got two flavor people. All right, just straight away. You've been at someone's house, you've had some of their food, and you take a bite and you go, oh, this needs some salt. Yes, this would be good. Or this has too much salt. Our daughter actually this past week uh, decided to make eggs for us, which was really great. And, uh, you know, as we sat down to eat the eggs, my dad behind her is just like, she kind of went a little crazy with this. And so sure enough, we took a bite and it was like, oh, honey, I will have a gallon of water to get through this. Okay, so salt adds flavor. What else does salt do? What else does salt do? What else do we use salt for? A preservative. Ooh, there we go. There we go, a preservative. In fact, that is the way in which the, the audience at the time, as they were listening, that's how they would connect to this because salt was needed to preserve, to actually stop the onset of decay in things. There was no refrigeration, naturally. And so what you needed to do is you needed to take salt and you salted the meat. And in doing so, by salting the meat, you actually were able to stop it from going bad. And this is the way you would keep things for a long period of time. So when Jesus is talking about the salt of the earth, he's talking about this aspect of stopping Decay. That's the first thing they would recognize when they hear it. Again, in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. 
the salt of the earth. Salt of the earth. Jesus, again, as I said earlier, is laying the groundwork in this message of what it means to be a believer, what it means to follow after him, what it means to bring about the kingdom into the world. And so if salt is a valuable commodity that stops the onset of decay, flavors things, and also is very just important for the the basis of our lives, it has a lot of value. It's very significant. And yet, Who is he speaking to on this one? You can answer if you want. Who is he speaking to on this one? He's not speaking to the disciples. He's speaking to everybody in the audience, actually. He's saying, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. When we hear the term, oh, man, he's just the salt of the earth, what does that mean? You can say it louder. It's okay. It's like a solid good person, right? Right. We, like, they have an important role to play. Like, you want to be around those type of people. In fact, uh, the, the, the language, even the way they use it, they say the salt of the earth. It was probably more like the salt of the land. And really what he's talking about is influence. It's close. It's, it's localized. It's, it's right next door type of scenario. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a very famous uh, preacher and teacher, wrote a, a two-volume part on the Sermon on the Mount, and it is just, it's amazing. It's actually just messages he gave. But he says this about salt in particular. He says, salt is essentially different from the medium in which it is placed, and in a sense, it exercises all its qualities by being different. So think about this. Jesus is talking about bringing about the kingdom into the world. He's talking about what it means to be a believer. And he is saying, salt, you are the salt of the earth. And in being that salt, you need to be different from the place you find yourself. Well, okay, that, that's very interesting. How, how do I be different? What, what is the method by which we're going to go about making that happen? And he actually just told us, In the verses previous, and he says this, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, this is not a power move. This, this is not hostile takeover. This is not uh, invasion. This is not us exerting our dominance. Uh, if anything, it was totally counter to the world in which those people were living. And as they heard it and received it, it would have been like, wait, What? Like, like this, is, this is upside down. This, this doesn't make any sense. This is going against their very nature as a person. And you know what? It's still going against ours even to this very day. We don't actively live like this. And, and I want to highlight this too. This isn't behavior modification, okay? This isn't trying to uh, uh, just like stop doing this and do this instead. Like I said, we have two small girls, so Stella's seven, Adria's five, and they have been home with Pop-Pop and Noni uh, for the last week and a half. And, uh, you know, we land, we're barely through the door, and it's already like, here's gift time, okay? And so my dad, being very practical, thought it would be good to give the girls a water bottle and like a like a drinking cup. It was like, oh, that's good. Actually, we we could use one of those. That would be great. Now, they were both filled to the brim with M&M's. And so it's one of those just like, okay, um, and then it, it's, it's this whole thing of just like, okay, girls, well, we're not going to eat all the M&Ms right now. And then it's this immediate deflection to like, Pop-Pop, can we have some M&Ms? Like, how do you already know this? Like, you've, you've already, like, and you know, so we try very hard to just be like, girls, please do not eat any more M&Ms. And they're, you know... Do you think they're going to listen to me? They're not going to listen to me, you know, uh, 
Back in 2019, before uh, everything changed, uh, we, we were able to have one last conference together as an organization, and we had a speaker come, and uh, his name was Peter Mead, and so speaking to a bunch of youth pastors, he said, I, I love speaking to you youth leader guys, because I constantly, I don't know how to say this, but I kind of ruin your whole gig from time to time, and I'm going to do it this morning as well too. And he said, uh, the nice thing is though, he's British, so everything he said sounds very nice, even when he kind of takes apart what we're, what we're doing. And he said, here's, here's the reality, is that, you know, you think that if you just educate and pressure, if you just kind of build into the thought processes of these students, you just tell them what to do and tell them what to do, that's going to influence their heart, and that will ultimately influence their actions. And he said, and you've seen it all before. You've got that kid, he's super great, he knows all the right stuff, you know, he can say all the books of the Bible really fast, and then he goes away for the summer, and he comes back, he's got a little kind of pep in his step and whatever else, and you're like, oh, hey, so like... What's been going on? I'm like, well, I kind of, I met somebody. Nice. Where does she go to church? Well, she doesn't go to church. But, you know, her mom or grandma goes to church. And she's thinking about maybe going with her grandma to church. And, you know, I, because the reality is, as he told us, he's like, it's the heart that influences the mind, that influences the action. What Jesus is talking about here is a heart change. This, this list of qualities is not, you don't wake up in the morning and just say, I'm going to be poor in spirit, I'm going to be poor in spirit, I'm going to be meek, I'm going to be meek, especially on Long Island. Uh, let's just be honest here. You know, this is something that requires a different stance. But remember, again, who is Jesus talking to in this? You. You are the salt of the earth. So what is that going to look like? What does that even mean? So here are some salt stories, if you will, from our neck of the woods. Uh, Lockdown gave us something really uh, unique uh, in a lot of different ways, but especially in the Czech Republic, and that was time with our neighbors. Uh, People over there do not tend to socialize with people outside their, you know, circle of friends, especially in regards to neighbors. People keep to themselves. There's a lot of distrust, and it goes very deep. So when you do things like cut your grass, and hang on here, I, I, I brought a picture to show. So this is our backyard right here. That's our lovely little cherry tree. And so uh, if you can see next to the cherry tree, there's a kind of line of trees and little like a uh, thing. That's our area of, of backyard. It's essentially this stage, just kind of slightly rearranged. And... Um, I'm a 40-year-old man in a house full of girls who has been doing, exactly, who's been doing (laughs) Zoom calls for the better part of a year and a half. So I came to this point of like, I need something tangible that I can say, I started and it looked like this, and I ended and it looked like that, and I have completed something. Behold. But the problem is, it's not a big enough yard. Like, I get the whole thing done in like 15 minutes. So I just cut... The second half, like past, you can see there's a little, there's the shed, and then behind the shed, there's a little trampoline, and there's a fence that you can't see. And so I just cut my neighbor's yard, and they're like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm, I'm cutting the grass. So that's Martin and Carolina's backyard. They live over there on that little door on the left-hand side. But Robert and Daniela, they're the landlords. They live in the, the big yellow house, you know, all together. And even they were like, what are you doing? Like, why would, you, why would you cut someone else's yard? Like, why would you cut their grass? They can do it. I'm like, hey, it's, it's fine. I'm happy to do it. In fact, I would like to do it. And they were shocked by this. In fact, Martin, here, we'll, we'll go to the next picture. Uh, Martin, so that's his wife, Carolina, there on the left, sitting and talking with Audrey. They have a little girl, uh, and so the girls all play in the backyard together, and so it started that, you know, well, they had the trampoline, and we had the slide, and we were like, use the slide. What? And you yeah, come on, it's fine, go play. And then the girls play on the trampoline and back and forth. And then that's me talking to my other neighbor, uh, Michael, on the other side of the fence. And that's our usual dynamic, him leaning out the window and commenting on the yard. Because, you know, that's how you begin to meet people. In fact, we have a rampant mole problem. And so that's how we kind of bonded of like, hey, how do you kill these things? Like, really kill these things. Um, but so, you know, this, this just started from something small, but the reality is who we were and the way that we were operating and just the choices that we made, they began to take notice. 
They began to recognize there was something different. And in fact, Martin and Carolina just had a girl uh, like a few months before we left. And once everything was kind of in the clear to get back together again, they invited all their family together to celebrate this new baby girl. And they invited us. And Martin told me, he says, hey man, I got to tell you, when, when Robert said that uh, they were having Americans move in here, I was like, oh great, here comes some fat, selfish, ignorant, good for nothing, <laughs> blah, 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 blahs. And you guys are actually really great. And so that was cool. Let's, let's have a couple other things. So uh, in the midst also of the pandemic and everything that was going on, um, our church has a very direct connection to a lot of the hospitals um, in, in the city. And the reason for that is the pastor of our church, he's not fully taken on board. Uh, he still kind of has another full-time job. And his full-time job is the head of one of the infectious disease wings uh, in the city. Great time to have that job, by the way, too. He's been super bored. Not a lot going on in his neck of the woods. But Cuba was able to connect us to the, nurse, the nurses in, in the two main hospitals in the city. And so we as a church began to make them cookies and bring them snacks on a regular basis. We would do this time and time again, which again for us might kind of seem like small. It blew their minds so much so that we got picked up on the news. Let's go to this, this next slide. That's Silva. She was the one who coordinated it. So you see this Zbor Sirkiv Braterska v Ostravia Troika. That's how you say Dix Hills in Czech. Um, <laughs> so that's the name of our church. But it got on the news a couple times, in fact. Like, look what these people are doing, helping out on just the most basic level. And then I'll give you one last story. So so these are the local wing. We kind of spread out a little bit more. This is our Polish team in JV. Uh, This is one of their regional meetings. That's our full Polish team, the whole staff there. Uh, When everything went upside down in 2020, they recognized that their summer ministries of English camps and sport camps and and music camps and different activities were all going right out the window. So guys, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And they said, well, um, you know, there's a lot of youth leaders that are behind the scenes of all of these different events that would have taken place. I think we should call them and check in on them. And not just like a once a month call and check in and like, you know, kind of a five minute conversation, see how you're doing, but more of a really focused, direct, multiple times a week. What do you need? How can I help? What are the resources you seem to be lacking? Let's just talk about who you are as a person. Can I take you out to coffee if at all possible? Can we go for a walk in the woods? Whatever it might be. And so they focus on that incarnational side of ministry And the results were unbelievable. These Polish leaders are coming back to them saying, like, no one has ever done this in my entire life. Not even the church staff that I'm volunteering with. And it took so much root within the team as a whole that they said, okay, for this next school year, from September 2021 until June of 2022, our primary focus is that every one of these guys has a Paul and a Timothy, and that is your main job, all right? Because we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we'll be able to do stuff, maybe we won't, but you will be able to disciple somebody and be discipled by somebody else, and that's what we want you to focus on. How is your salt? And what does that look like in your neck of the woods? Now, I do also have to say that Cutting your neighbor's grass is not the gospel, like laid out and like that's good enough. You know, th- th- this is a step in a, in a right direction. Jesus, you know, if you want to read how Jesus interacted with people he didn't know, read the story of the, the woman at the well, because within six seconds he goes from, can I have a cup of water to, if you knew what this water was and here's who I am. So we are in that process as well of using that open door to step through and be more than just salt, because there's more that goes on with this passage. And let's, let's talk about the second half of it. Now, there is a negative, but we'll get to that at the end. Okay, verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Once again, I want to draw your attention to a very specific word at the very beginning, and it is you. You are the light of the world. Now, let's think about light for a second. We talked about salt. We know what salt does. Let's talk about light real quick. Um, 
light is unbelievable, okay? It is, it is an amazing property, substance. I don't even know how to categorize it. But everything you're seeing right now, you are seeing because of light. If there was no light, all of this, there would be nothing, how many of you, we don't need to do a show of hands, but how many of you, if you, you know, first get your license and you're driving on one of those dark roads and you got your lights on, how many of you have turned the lights off, right, just to like see what it's like? And then you, you turn it back on real quick. Uh, but, you know, you turn off and it's like you see nothing. Or maybe you've been in like, you know, you, you wander into some closet, you know, the closet door shuts and it's like, I cannot even see my hand in front of my face, Like, light illuminates everything. It allows us to see and know what is around us. But then light also does something. I'm a bit of a, a, along with the fantasy nerd thing and Star Wars stuff, I'm also just a bit of a regular space nerd and astronomy in general. And light is a big deal in space because the light you're all experiencing right now is you, everybody can look out the windows. You can look out the, so there's light out the windows, right? Yes, yes, yes. It took a, oh, thank you, Kathy. It took a half a second, but we got it there. But that light traveled from the sun, and that light is actually eight minutes old. It took eight minutes from the light from the sun to actually get here to right now. And do you know how far that light traveled in eight minutes? A lot. Very good. Very good. A lot equals 93 million miles, okay? 93 million miles in eight minutes. Boom, right here. In fact, when you look at constellations at night, depending on which constellation it is, some of it you're looking at light from four to five years ago. Some of it you're looking at light from four to five hundred years ago that just made it here to earth. Light moves. It goes at rapid pace and usually cannot be stopped. And then Martin Lloyd-Jones says this about light. Light not only exposes the darkness, it shows and provides the only way out of the darkness, a way out of the darkness. So I would remind you one more time, church, you are the light of the world, not society, not knowledge, not science, not good feelings, not the internet. You are the light of the world, believers and followers of Jesus. And a city set on a hill cannot be what? Hidden. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. One of the things I love about living in the Czech Republic is that we literally have castles everywhere. You guys have Dunkin' Donuts everywhere? We have castles everywhere, okay? And do you know where the castles are? They're on the hill. Yes, they're up on the hill. No one puts a castle in a valley. That becomes a pile of rocks. No, the castles are up on the hills for multiple reasons. So that they can see everything around them, but so everyone else knows where they are. They're everywhere. In fact, I I know I'm going to drive the girls crazy because, you know, we drive around and I'm still like, girls, there's a castle. Hey, girls, there's a castle. Girls, there's a castle. They're going to be teenagers just being like, yes, dad, I know there's castles everywhere. No one cares anymore. Um, But so, remember... Salt, specific, local, close, and the land again. But light, where does light go? The light of the world. This is actually Jesus giving all of us and giving the audience at the time a hint of things that would be coming. It's the expanse of the gospel to the nations. And he's even speaking this about himself because in John chapter 8, verses 12, he says, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So his light is being transferred to us, and we in turn continue the mission that he began. Because if you look at, and this one's just like, this one's awesome. Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. So we're going all the way back to Isaiah, folks, in terms of prophecy of what is coming. It is speaking of Jesus, and he in turn is giving it to you. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And see, this is where the mission side of it then comes into play that each and every one of us have a part in. One of the things that's been, uh, you know, as I said, within Josiah Venture, our goal is to equip these young men and women uh, to fulfill Christ's commission, to do it through the local church, and to build into the lives, uh, again, of the young people around them. You see, under communism, you could not train young people. 
The church could exist, but you couldn't train young people because the idea was after a certain amount of time, they're all going to die and the church will die with them and we won't have to worry about it. So there's been a problem of trying to build into the lives of these young people and what it is to actually train within the churches themselves. And now, when I first came over to Central Europe, it was a funny thing. Um, You know, you go to these English camps and man, you needed to have mere Christianity memorized. You had more than a carpenter in your back pocket. I mean, it was this like apologetics shoot off at night during evening program, you know, just question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. And something's happened though over the course of the last decade that we've been there. You know, because the young people aren't interested in the questions or the answers to the questions anymore. Do you know what they're actually interested in? Anybody want to venture a guess? Results. Not results, but I heard somebody say it. They're interested in you. So maybe that is kind of results. That does actually kind of work because they want to see if what you say matches with who you are. They want to know that this Jesus you're proclaiming, this life that you think is so great, is that really what you're doing behind the scenes? They want to pull back the curtain. Another way of putting it, they want to know, are you worth your salt? And here's where we kind of get into the complicated part. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And what about the other one? You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. So we need to ask this question, how is your salt? How is your light? Do you have that salty flavor? Is your light shining or is it hidden? And, and also, we need to point out as well, too, Jesus did this in a very specific order. The salt comes before the light, because if you're not legit and genuine here in the close proximity of peoples and neighbors and friends and whoever it might be, this isn't going to hold up. How many times have you had somebody who's, they're broadcasting the light and they're doing a great job, and what is it like behind the scenes? It's the sad reality, especially over the last couple of years, of just big key leaders who fall one after another after another. Where is the salt? Where is the light? Because I, I just, I got to be honest, church, there are a lot of stressed out, angry, anxious, money-loving, hurtful, impatient, nasty people out there, and that's not including the non-Christians. Oh. See what, see what he did? See what he did? See, this is the advantage of uh, speaking every two years. You can just come and say these things. Say, Jim, good luck. You got him next week. Good job, buddy. Okay, great. Are we truly different? Are we? And I'm asking myself this question. This is not me to come and broadcast against you guys because I have to do the same thing myself. Do I shine peace that passes understanding? Do I demonstrate the kingdom to the people around me, or am I just wandering in darkness as well, saying one thing and doing another? One last time for Martin Lloyd-Jones, the glory of the gospel is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts it. It is then that the world is made to listen to her message, though it may hate it at first. Otherwise, if we Christians are indistinguishable from non-Christians, we are useless. We might as well be discarded like saltless salt, thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. Am I different? Am I living a life that makes my neighbors say, what's up with that guy? Do I demonstrate the kingdom to the people around me? Am I a a non-anxious presence? Am I a place of peace that people question and go, what's the deal? Or am I like everybody else that they know, but I just do something different on Sunday mornings? And I feel this is the great reality that, that we as Christians in 2021 need to take some time and ask ourselves, because Jesus said, who? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. We have a part to play within this mission. And, and how many times, though, have we done things like we throw our hands up and we say, oh, this world is the worst. You would not believe what's happening. Everything is so terrible. Yeah, 
It's supposed to do that. You don't take a steak out of the fridge, put it on the back patio, and just let it sit in the sun and go, oh, I can't believe that thing rotted. This is so unbelievable. Now, if it was a McDonald's hamburger, I think they don't rot. That's what I've heard. They just, they stay forever, but they're not real, so there you go. See, we can't be the ones who complain and rail about the things going on outside because that's what outside is supposed to be. This, this is the fallen world in which we live in. To bring the kingdom requires a life filled with Jesus, one that mirrors those beatitudes. To be, and again, this is a heart posture, folks. This takes time to build and become. It is not something we're just going to drill into our heads over and over and over again, and then hopefully one day we'll just wake up and it happened. So how do we, what are some practical tips? What can we do? How do we be this salt and light to the world around us? So, just some tangible things. Maybe you, you're not able to cut your neighbor's grass. I know how you guys are about your lawns over here. But maybe when the trash can's out on the street, you can bring it in. Maybe you can offer to help with some yard work sometimes. Maybe you just need to call a friend and sit and listen to them, not diagnose their problems and give them all the answers that they need, but just simply take some space to listen. Pray with your friends when they tell you their problems, and right then and there, don't wait to do it later. Pray for the people you really love. Also, pray for the people you really don't. Learn to listen to the Spirit's promptings in your heart and in your life. You know, we've been in that position where, you know, we're standing there and it's like, hey, you should go talk to that guy. And it's like, I don't want to talk to that guy. You should talk to that guy. Okay. If someone cuts you off, don't freak out. That always gets the hardest one, you know, depending on where we're at. Slow down. Take a breath. Pick the longest line uh, in the supermarket and maybe talk to the person in front of you. We need to begin to work these habits. We need to give thanks often. We need to work on what it means to be salt. So I'll tell you one more time. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. It is not just left to the pastors or to the theologians or to the missionaries. You, we, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Let me pray for you missionaries as you head out into your mission field here. Jesus, I thank you again for an opportunity just to uh, be with your people and to be reminded of what you've called us to. And it seems daunting at times. It seems like it's one of those things where that's not what I really signed up for. And yet, we're a part of this. We get to be a part of this mission, and we get to be that difference within this fallen world. An opportunity to be salt, an opportunity to be light. Because as we radiate what it means to be the kingdom with those close to us, it radiates out and demonstrates to a world that is lost in darkness that there is light, there is hope, and there is Jesus at the end of that. So I pray for the men and women in this room, for this church, as they head out into their mission field. I ask that you would bless them, you would stay with them, and Lord, you would increase again, and may your kingdom come soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Integrity Church. Thank you so much for joining us and being part of the family here at Integrity Church. I hope that you are staying safe with the storm and that you felt blessed by the message this morning. Um, we want to let you know that our Pillars Men's Ministry is hosting a family fishing trip, and that will be coming up on September 18th, and that's a Saturday. Um, we'll be leaving out of Santa Mariches on a boat called the Rosie, and it will start at 7 a.m., and then we will come back at 11 a.m., um, it'll be $40 per person, and that'll cover your fishing pole, your bait and tackle, anything that you might need. Um, and again, all are welcome. This is a family fishing trip, so we're super excited about that. Um, if you can, if you are interested, we would love if you could register on our website, on the app, or when we get back to Integrity Church at the Welcome Center. Also around the corner is something called the Truth Project, and that'll be starting Wednesday, September 8th. Um, at 7 p.m. So it'll be four consecutive Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We'll be taking a break and then we'll have four consecutive Wednesdays after that. Um, and again, if you're interested, you can register the same ways on the website 
on the app or at the Connect counter back at church. Also, last thing is that there will be a Pillars Men's Gathering and that'll be on September 1st at 6 p.m. So guys, if you haven't already, you can still register online for that. I hope you all have a great Sunday. Love you guys. Bye. Hey, I hope you were blessed by that message today. I pray that it continues to encourage you throughout the week and just remind you of the uh, amazing ways in which God can work in our midst if we just trust him, right? And so uh, super excited, so thankful again to have Rob and Audrey with us and uh, pray their bl God's blessings upon them. And hey, thanks for uh, jumping on today. I know uh, this isn't the best way to go, but thank God for the kind of technology that we have that allows for us to, uh, even in the midst of whether it's pandemics or hurricanes, right, we're able to still worship God together. And so you have a blessed day. If you need anything, once again, sure, be sure to reach out to us. We're here to serve you. We love you, praying for you, and look forward to seeing you soon. God bless.